everyone and welcome to today's video which is going to be on audit sampling. Alright, so sampling means when we draw from, or we make a conclusion, not from uh, evidence gathered on the entire set of accounting documents, but on a small sample. So what we're doing, if this is all our accounting data is that we're selecting particular transactions to test and gather our audit evidence and we're going to use that evidence to build a conclusion about whether the account is free from material misstatements. So remember to look up ASA 320 or ISA 320 if you're using international auditing standards for materiality. Now our evidence must be according to ISA 500 or ASA 500 because they're identical, sufficient and appropriate. So sufficient means enough in terms of quantity and appropriate means the right sorts of evidence. So you've used the right mix of audit procedures and um, the right sources of documents. So in audit sampling, we make a conclusion about the entire accounting set of data based on a sample of transactions. sampling, I like to break sampling down into two components. The first part is calculating the sample size. And then the second component is the method to select the sample. with calculating the sample size. There are two methods for calculating the sample size. First is statistical and the second is non-statistical. So let's start with the statistical option first. Alright, so the statistical sampling method uses a mathematical formula that uses our reliability factor uh, and I'll actually talk more about reliability factors in another video. Um, and either the materiality or the potential misstatement amount or the tolerable rate of deviation to identify the sample size for test of controls or substantive testing. So when we do control testing, we use the formula N for sample size equals the reliability factor divided by the tolerable deviation rate. So how many deviations are we willing to allow places where the control doesn't operate as designed? When we're looking substantively, we use a similar formula. N equals the reliability rate, but instead of using the tolerable deviation rate, we use materiality divided by book value. And that's often rewritten in this particular format here. BV times R divided by tolerable misstatement, which is materiality. So it's the same sort of approach um, and I'm going to go through in detail in a second video about how we actually do these particular calculations. But statistical sampling requires you to use one of these two formulas and then use a reliability factor table. The other option is non-statistical. Right. And the non-statistical method relies on the individual auditor's judgment. So the senior or manager or partner decides we're going to test 20, 30, 50 transactions and we don't use any sort of formula. Now, 
Out of these two approaches, what we see in practice is a use of non-statistical sampling over statistical sampling. In later videos, we'll talk about how statistical sampling actually gives us very large samples when you're looking at large public companies. So, so for someone like Coca-Cola, um, a sample might turn out to be 10,000 sales, which is actually pro probably physically impossible to be able to test. So I'm going to talk about calculations of those samples later, but just as a basic, you need to know that they're statistical and non-statistical methods. So how do I actually go about selecting my sample? There's a couple of different options. The first one is random. We use a random number generator and rely on probability theory to allow a machine to randomly select our samples. If we're statistical, statistically sampling, then the best thing that we can do is also use random sampling to go along with that. The other option, option two, is often called interval sampling. So interval involves collecting every nth transaction. So that might be every 200th, every 150,000th in equal sequence. Okay. Now that every nth might be based on individual transactions or it could be based on dollars in what is sometimes called dollar unit sampling. Our third method is haphazard. And I like to describe haphazard as being the human equivalent to being random. So in random sampling, we'll use the probability theory and a random number generator. In haphazard sampling, I'll use my own human ability in an attempt to be random. Our next option, judgmental. Now, judgmental means selecting particular transactions. Now, in textbooks, judgmental is typically frowned upon, but judgmental sampling can come in handy. If you're testing um, intangible assets, an impairment of those intangible assets, then you might want to selectively or judgmentally um, sample the largest uh, acquisitions of firms or intangible assets to impair. And the last method is what is called block. And block involves selecting transactions from a particular period of time, one month or two months out of the financial period. Now typically that is frowned upon uh, when you're testing completeness, uh, sorry, existence of assets uh, or you're testing occurrence of sales or accuracy of sales. But there is one assertion where block comes into its own. And that is completeness. And the reason that we might use block selection is that in order to achieve completeness in many firms, a lot of companies use pre-numbered documents. That could be pre-numbered invoices or purchase orders or requisitions or employee numbers. So if I want to check that a batch of purchase orders is complete, that there are no purchase orders missing, then I would need to select a block of those purchase orders from one particular month or a couple of weeks of the year and then check the sequence of each individual transaction to make sure that there are no transactions missing. If I wanted to do this completeness test, if I didn't search by block, then I actually wouldn't be able to test complete completeness in that manner. So if I selected one transaction from June, one transaction from May, two transactions from April, I couldn't actually tell whether they are in sequence or not. So in terms of our sampling, we can have statistical or non-statistical to come up with our sample size. And then I can use any one of the five options to select my sample. So I might use non-statistical sampling to come up with an idea of 50 transactions to sample, but then use random selection to select that sample, or interval, or haphazard. The same statistical sampling, I could use interval, haphazard, or random. So there's nothing to say that statistical sampling 
always has to use random methods to select that sample. Um, there's a bit of mix and match between all of those. Now there's one other thing that we can also do. And oh, my pen's not working. That is the idea of the term stratify or stratification. So stratification means taking our population and breaking it into different groups. Okay? So I stratify a population, and for example, for uh, accounts receivable, I might break that up into uh, accounts that are worth a million dollars or more. I might have then accounts that are 500,000 to a million, and then 500,000 or smaller. And then within that stra those strata, I can then sample within those as well. Stratification can often be done on dollar amounts, but you could also uh, break up populations even by geographical locations. So if you're auditing inventory, you might break up that inventory by geographical locations. 